<laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you. Loud. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Carrie Diamond. I'm the editor-in-chief of Yahoo Food and the founder of Cherry Bomb Magazine. And a show of hands, how many people have seen the Dos Equis Most Interesting Man in the World commercials? Almost everybody. So every time I see those commercials, I think Dos Equis got that wrong. The most interesting man in the world is actually the man <laughs> sitting next to me. It's Nathan Mirvold. So if you're here, you know all about Nathan. He's the founder of Modernist Cuisine. He is the founder of Intellectual Ventures. He's the founder of a lot of things. Um, I called Nathan before, the, before today so we could chat and just catch up and see what he's been up to. And I said, have you been anywhere interesting lately? And of course he had been. <laughs> With Nathan, that's always you know, an obvious question. So he said, uh, yes, I have. I've been uh, to Svalbard. Did I get that right? Svalbard. For those it of helps you... if you say it like a pirate. Oh, right. Svalbard. Svalbard in um, Spitsbergen, Norway. So for those of you out there who are food nerds of the highest order, or you're really into doomsday scenarios, you know what that is. And I'll let Nathan explain a little bit more what that is and why he was there. Well, <clears throat> there's lots of varieties of seeds. Uh, and there are things called seed banks around the world where they preserve varieties of seeds, both the major commercial varieties, but also lots of heirloom varieties of seeds. So this crazy guy uh, got the idea that what if there was a calamity and civilization totally dissolved, wh where is the backup seed vault for the planet? So this is like, you know, there's a water world scenario and Kevin Costner with his little gills has to go somewhere to get the last seeds so they can replant the planet. Well, he actually convinced the Norwegian government to build this thing. Um, they had searched the whole world, and they discovered that this island of Spitsbergen, part of an archipelago called Svalbard, which is a thousand miles north of the Arctic Circle, is, was in fact the ideal place. And so they built it, and this is the entrance to it, which looks sort of like the monolith in 2001, if you remember back that far. So we, uh, do, we do have a photo, if you can put the photo on the, yeah. on the screen. Can you see it on the sides? Great. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> so you enter this thing, and then you go a half a mile back into the mountain. It was an old copper mine. And you get to this inner sanctum where the door is crusted with frost. Because not only is it in permafrost, so it's always frozen, they actually refrigerate it further than that. Uh, and so we went in to photograph these last seeds that will reboot all of civilization. And it's kind of a cool thing because on one hand, you totally hope that the world never comes to that. But it's kind of cool someone thought about it and uh, <laughs> um, you know, got it ready. I, I guess here's a shot of the uh, uh, inside the seed vault. You see these boxes of seeds uh, as far as the eye can see. So good news I, I got frostbite on my nose in there. That's how cold it was. Inside? I, inside, wow. yes. Actually, much colder inside than it was outside. And I discovered on Wikipedia, that small amounts of frostbite are called frost nip. Did anybody know that? So I was frost nipped. But your nose is fine now. Yes, it yes. is now. Yes. So it's good to know if you're the last human being left on the planet, all you need to do is get yourself to Spitsbergen, yep. find those seeds, get into the repository, and you'll have food. Yeah. Right. So. Um, so the, uh, <coughs> when Nathan told me he had been there, I said to him, because I had only seen pictures, I've never visited, I said, did it look like the opening scene from Empire Strikes Back? Because that's exactly <laughs> what it looked like. And you said, yes. yes, it looked just like the planet Hoth, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, I was happy to hear that Nathan was a Star Wars fan. That makes all the sense in the world. Um, have you seen the Force Awakens trailer? I have to <laughs> I, ask. I have that. seen the trailer. I have not seen the rest. Are you OK with the trailer? Where, where are you on the trailer? <laughs> I know there are a lot of opinions I, about the trailer. OK, so I, I'm a Star Wars fan at a level where I really enjoy it, not where I am so into it that I get mad at like petty little details and argue endlessly. Okay. I, okay. I, 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 many of my friends are that kind of person. <laughs> so, we were talking, so we were talking about Star Wars, and then the Star Wars trailer led us to talking about dinosaurs, because if you know Nathan, you know that dinosaurs is a big thing of his. And I asked if he saw the Jurassic World trailer, and you've not seen that yet. Correct. 
but you, but he did tell me that he was on set for the original Jurassic Park, which yes. was amazing. Yes, in fact, I think, if, is this picture up? Is there a picture of me mm -hmm. in the dirt? Mm -hmm. um, that's what a Tyrannosaurus Rex looks like in the ground. That's one that I found. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't look like very much. Uh, that's why you have to do a lot of work to dig it on out. Um, so you, so you and Jack Horner are friends. He's yep. one of the leading paleontologists on the planet. Yeah, and yeah. he's the sort of the model for the lead character in Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. And you have been on a lot of these. Tell us about your your dinosaur well, adventure. Well, so Jack and I have dug up dinosaurs from all over the world. Um, dinosaurs are always in the same kind of place. It always has horrible weather. <laughs> And the reason for that is to find a dinosaur, first you need rocks of the right age, rocks from the Cretaceous or uh, Jurassic or Triassic periods. Uh, um, so 200 million to um, 65 million years ago. Well, the, then those rocks have to be on the surface. Lots of other areas, there's more recent rock on, on the surface, and so you can't get down to it. But then you need to have weather that's terrible. Because if you don't have terrible weather, soil forms and trees and plants grow and there's no erosion. So you always find um, dinosaurs in badlands areas where it's too hot and dry during the summer for plants to grow or in, in the Arctic where it's too cold for plants to grow and then where there's lots of erosion. So just like skiers pray for snow, we, we paleontologists pray for erosion. Because um, you can't just sort of dig blindly to find a dinosaur. What, the way you find dinosaurs, this is going to sound really silly, is you hike around looking at the ground until you find a dinosaur. Um, and sometimes you find tiny little pieces and you trace them back to where it's coming out of the hill. But uh, we found one T-Rex where the femur bone is what we found. The femur is your you know, upper leg bone. And the femur of a T-Rex is like from me to carry and is about her body mass. And we found it just sitting on top of the ground. It looked like something off the set of the Flintstones. And so it, it's sort of impossible not to find it if you happen to be there. The flip side is it probably means no human had been there in the time it had been exposed, which is probably wow. at least 50 years. And there are still places like that. Um, I've been to Mongolia doing this. I've been to China. Uh, but mostly we wind up digging in uh, Montana. And there's parts of Montana where no one's ever uh, been or, or not for the last 50 years. And true or false, you have a T-Rex skeleton in your living room. I do. You do. My question is, how did you get that past your wife and your interior decorator? <laughs> Careful negotiation. <laughs> so we're going to go back to... Um... No, and it turns out those are not the problems. The problem is having a living room big enough to put a T-Rex in. <laughs> exactly. Um, oh, and one thing, if you um, are on Twitter, you can tweet some questions to Nathan at hashtag AskNathan, and we'll cover those questions at the end of the talk. Um, so we're going to go back. So you were born in Seattle, yep. and then your family moved to Los Angeles. Yep. Um, it was your brother, your mom, yep. was a single mom. Um, you went to a school for very gifted children with very high IQs, and you graduated from high school at the age of 14, correct? Yeah. And then you went on to college and graduated at the age of 17. Yeah. Nathan has more degrees than I can even memorize. Um, and then you eventually went on to Cambridge, where you studied and worked with Stephen Hawking. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your Stephen Hawking days? It's really hard to feel sorry for yourself if you work for Stephen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, here's this guy who is under crushing physical circumstances, things that would just take the spirit out of anybody, yet he's really funny. He loves telling jokes. He's upbeat. He'll even say, oh, my, my condition is an advantage to me. And he said, the first time he said that to me, I said, Stephen, bullshit. This can't possibly be true. But it, it, it's the kind of spirit that he has. Mm -hmm. And then that sort of embarrasses everyone around him to act like better people. Mm -hmm. um, it, academics can be very pedantic and be very petty. 
it was very hard for other people in the department to feel that way or act that way when Stephen Hawking is around. It's just this incredible example. So what were you doing while you were over there? So I was working on um, fundamental theories of space and time, mm -hmm. trying to figure out where space, time, and the universe came from. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> we keep thinking. Um, it, you know, actually, since the time that I was working on this, uh, we actually have lots more information and data on mm -hmm. cosmology. Uh, a series of satellites has mapped what's called the cosmic microwave background radiation, which tells us a lot of things about the very early universe. And for many years, people would concoct a theory of cosmology, of where the, how the universe or, originated, and you couldn't test the theory. Well, now we have data that we can test the theory with, and by God, every single theory we have is broken by that test. <laughs> and it's continued, it's for the last 10 years, there's been feverish activity, mm -hmm. and nothing works yet. But th that's actually a great thing in science, where you've got both a fundamental mystery and a way to confirm your, your, what you're doing. You know, it's really hard to do science without the feedback cycle of being able to see what nature actually thinks of it and, and test your theories. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll note that we haven't talked about food yet. I remember <laughs> when I first learned about Nathan, I went on his Wikipedia page and I was like, wait a second, there's, this is a really long Wikipedia entry and the amount devoted to food is about this big. So how is the food in Cambridge? <laughs> Well, it, England actually has had a culinary renaissance, but that all happened after I left. <laughs> in 1983, 84, when I was there, um, British food was living right up to its, uh, uh, its reputation. Yeah. So why did you leave? I, I remember having a, uh, a, a formal dinner with Stephen and a bunch of these dons, and as we are going out, I said to Stephen, I said, do you have any idea what the meat was? <laughs> because I developed this, this term, BBR, boiled beyond recognition. <laughs> and, and that's what that food had, been, it had happened to it. So why'd you leave Cambridge? Uh, well, a whole bunch of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually, it was semi-accidental. I didn't really leave leave. I, I went on a leave of absence. Mm -hmm. And I, it was only for a temporary period. Uh, for the summers, it was supposed to be. And I started working, it was to work on a software project with a couple friends of mine. We started it before we'd, I finished my PhD. And we thought, oh, I'll just work on it for a couple months and then I'll come back, Stephen. Mm -hmm. And well, a couple months kept getting extended and extended and then we started a company and then Microsoft bought my company. And I was at Microsoft for 14 years. And then it was announced that I was leaving Microsoft and I got an email from Stephen the next day. So, we're clearing out the office. <laughs> Are you going to be back? And the answer was no. Well, sadly, no. So you just glossed over a whole lot of interesting time. <coughs> um, so you started your own company and Microsoft bought it. And then that started your Microsoft adventures. Mm -hmm. So you were there for 14 years. Yep. And your main roles there were chief technology officer and chief strategist. And um, for those of you who've never read this, uh, Bill Gates has said that Nathan is the smartest person he's ever met. So that's coming from Bill Gates. That's pretty high praise, I would imagine. So better than coming from me. You are the smartest mm -hmm. person I've ever met. But um, so, so what do those job titles mean? What did you do at Microsoft? Well, that was a super exciting time in the hi history of the personal computer. Um, the computing prior to the 80s had been something that was only in big business in the form of mainframe computers or it was done in, in scientific context. And it, it, it sounds almost you know, like I'm your grandfather or something, but back in my day, you know, we, um, I, I remember I was the, when I was a freshman in college, mm -hmm. we couldn't use calculators, we had to use slide rules. It was sophomore year that calculators were allowed. And that just, it sounds ridiculous, but I actually lived that. Um, and he, there was this great opportunity with microprocessor technology to take this awesome power, which at that point was doubling every 12 to 18 months with Moore's Law. And so you can say, well, if we can put this in the hands of everybody, mm -hmm. 
and harness it towards the things they want to do, whether they're productivity applications like Excel or Word or things like that, or they're fun things, they're games, um, or communication, other stuff, that something amazing would happen. And, and it did, and it was fantastic being, uh, being right at the center of it all at Microsoft. So I was reading a piece in The New Yorker by Ken Oletta, and he was talking about, apparently Nathan would write these really famous memos that were sometimes up to 100 pages. Can you imagine getting that from your boss? Here's another 100-page memo. But they got to be famous in the company. And Oletta had excerpted some of them. And basically around 1991, you predicted the iPhone, you predicted social media, you predicted streaming video, and you predicted video on demand. So are you going to publish these memos in a book one day? I want to read all these Ma memos. Maybe someday. <laughs> um, I have to wait for the statute of limitations to expire. Um, it, you know. A lot of the trends in technology can be predicted, not, not all, but many can, because there, it's a combination of understanding that the computing power or the communications bandwidth or things like that are going to be growing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're used by people. And people have a whole set of needs that aren't, and they're not going to change, okay? So, Turns out your eyes generally work best at about the distance of your hands. This is not an accident. We have fingers so we can manipulate things and that's where we can see. And so a book or a phone or a tablet or a laptop are always gonna be arm's length kinds of things. Um, maybe a little bit closer, but it's fundamentally about that. Meanwhile, if we're sharing an experience, like we're watching a movie, then that's got to be at least 10 feet away. So the, we, there's the two feet things and the 10 feet things. And those, that's governed by the way our bodies are shaped. And that's not going to change anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people like to be able to uh, see media whenever they could. And the great example of that what in that era was books. Mm -hmm. You could read any book you wanted any time you wanted. Books were very widely available. TV in, when the, in back in the 90s, back in my day, um, was very restricted to things where you'd either have to rent a tape mm -hmm. uh, or a disc, or you would have to, um, and the, there wasn't huge supply, or it would all be scheduled. And if you missed 8 o'clock, you know, unless you set your VCR to mm -hmm. tape it, you know, you were out of luck. Well, why wouldn't you have video on demand? Why wouldn't you have all of this other stuff? Mm -hmm. What was it like at Microsoft back then? I mean, that was the wild west of technology. What was it like? Well, it was very exciting. Yeah. It was very exciting. And, you know, today, uh, the companies that are on that exciting kind of a curve are places like Uber um, or, uh, you know, Facebook or perhaps Google. Uh, when, when you're out creating brand new products all the time, mm -hmm with enormous capabilities being added, and all these things coming in, and you're growing super fast, but then that's also really painful because there's all kinds of problems that come from growing super fast. It was a very exciting time. Mm -hmm. So we're getting closer to the food part of Nathan's life. So, so while you were at Microsoft, you've got all these hobbies. One of your hobbies happened to be food. So you decided to stage at a restaurant in Seattle. Well, I decided actually to go to um, cooking school. That was mm -hmm. my first decision. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to cooking school, and I figured if I'm going to go to cooking school, why not go in fr to France? So I applied to this cooking school. And they said, oh, they wrote back, and they, they said, well, we have these courses for amateurs, sir. I said, no, 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 I, I, I want to go to the professional <laughs> course. So they said, well, we'll, uh, we'll arrange an examination. So I had an oral exam over the phone for like an hour, asking me all these questions. Like, you're making a fish stock, a veal stock, and a chicken stock. How long do each one cook? You're making puff pastry. How do you fold the uh, détente? The, the, well, I got them all right, which just pissed them all off. And they said, we, OK, we'll take you, but only if you work in a restaurant first. So that's why I arranged a stage in uh, Rover's, which at the time was the best French restaurant in Seattle. Mm -hmm. I worked there for one night a week. for it, Things got extended so, for two years. Wow. So you did not have an insignificant job at Microsoft, and you're staging, going to culinary school. How did you, how did you get to do all these things? Well, when I went to build, I get the leave of absence to go to culinary school. Um, it was certainly the first such request he'd ever got. 
And I think it's the last such request he's ever gotten. <laughs> but, uh, but he supported it. And how was culinary school? It was awesome. Yeah, yeah. What were, what were some of the memorable things from it? Well, at, at Rover's, um, this is not the kind of admission I should make in public, but I boned a lot of ducks. <laughs> and it's this classic French technique where you, you cut all, all of the, uh, both the skin and the meat away, so you take all of the, the skeleton out and then you can um, make it into a galatine or there's a variety of other things you can do once you've, you've taken all the bones out. Mm -hmm. Well, one morning at the culinary school, they had these very gruff French chefs and we, were, we had to bone ducks. Mm -hmm. So I'm working away and I'm, this guy comes up, he says, you, you that, where did you learn this? I'm like, he says, you know a duck like a Frenchman. <laughs> So around this time, I think you were redoing your kitchen and you started to look into equipment for the kitchen. And you were interested in some very high-tech pieces. And that began. Yeah, so I chapter. had, I was aware that there was a, a, a that time, very small uh, nascent movement. <coughs> I'd heard of Ferran Adria. I'd been to uh, uh, Vera, which is a restaurant, sort of avant-garde restaurant in France. Mm -hmm. I'd read uh, Harold McGee's great book when it uh, came out um, a few years before that. So I knew that there was this, all these brand new cooking techniques that had gone well past the uh, sort of classic French techniques or even the Nouvelle French techniques. And I kind of naively thought, there's got to be some big book that if I get that big book, I will, you know, I'll learn all this stuff. I'll get up to speed. because. The, the, all the old classic stuff, I, I, I kind of knew. Well, I couldn't find the damn book. And I actually, I started a, a thread on e -Gullet. Does anybody remember e in the room? Mm -hmm. So I started this thread on e basically asking, hey, there's got to be some sous vide information out there. And what I discovered is there was hardly any. And a lot of the, the sous vide information that was out there seemed to me, just on the basis of physics, to be like completely wrong, just like obviously wrong. Well, that can't possibly be true. So I started doing experiments. Mm -hmm. And you know, doing what I think anyone would do if they converted a problem like this, I started writing lots of code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I wrote all of these programs to simulate heat flowing through food using the heat equation. And um, that really convinced me a lot of the things were wrong. Mm -hmm. And so then I started doing experimental tests of it. And somebody in the gullet said, you know, you should write a book. Mm -hmm. And that sort of led me down the path of modernist cuisine. So instead of buying that big book, I wound up writing that big book. <laughs> so when you set out to write the book, did you have any idea that it would be this multi-volume? So, How many pounds? 45 pounds 45 without pounds. the case. I mean, 50 <laughs> pounds in the box. Um, so I made an outline. Mm -hmm. and. <coughs> The interesting thing is, I made the outline in like 2005, and when we finally shipped it in 2011, it was basically the same book. Wow. But in 2005, I thought it would be huge. I thought it'd be 600 pages. And now 600 pages is like clearing my throat. It's sort of like the, <laughs> yes, yeah, so that'll be the, the preface will be 600 pages. So did you shop it around to publishers, or did you know from the outset you would publish this yourself? Well, it, but when you first get the vision of something mm -hmm. like this, it's sort of like glimpsing at a mountain in the fog. You know, you're, you're aware there's something out there, but you can't really see it that clearly. Mm -hmm. But I had a strong feeling of what I wanted to, to make. And it was very hard to describe because I couldn't see it all myself. It was something more that you could feel than you could tangibly mm -hmm. describe. And then if you really start to describe it, I, I did start to a little bit, and then people get this funny look in their eyes like, this man is crazy. So I said, what the hell, we'll, we'll get a long ways into it, mm -hmm. and then maybe we'll show it to some publishers. Mm -hmm. And so we did. Um, well, first it was me for two years alone. Uh, then I realized it was going to take 100 years to finish. And this is post-Microsoft now. Yes. Yeah. It was after Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I, started this other company, so I had a day job, mm -hmm. but I was also working on this book. 
So then I decided I needed to hire a team. And that was a great decision because, um, you know, in software, there's very few great pieces of software that are written by a single person. You can do it, but the optimal size team for software is not one. It's also not a thousand. It's really hard to, to have a thousand people or even a hundred people work on software. But there's some sweet spot where you get people who understand the, the goals, each grab their own piece and the, apply their own expertise. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we organized the book. Uh, and uh, it led to a book that was vastly better than anything I could have done by myself. How did the name Modernist Cuisine come about? Well, there, as I said, there was this nascent movement mm -hmm. uh, with chefs like um, Ferran Adria in Spain, uh, Heston Blumenthal in the UK, uh, Wiley Dufresne or Grant Ackett's in the United States, mm -hmm. and, and lots more, more, more than I'm going to be able to list. And those people were each doing their own different things, mm -hmm. but they were clearly trying, rebelling against the old order. And to me, that was exactly like the modernist approach in architecture or art or literature, you know, mm -hmm. from the sort of late 19th century through the early 20th century, modernism in one form or another really revamped almost every area of human endeavor. And yet in that same era, there was no modernist revolution in food. Food was the only thing that was really left out. Mm -hmm. The Nouvelle Cuisine Revolution in the late 60s and, and into the 70s in France was sort of the first glimmers of that. Um, maybe analogous to the French Impressionists in, in visual arts, who are on the leading edge of the modern revolution. But the, the problem with the Nouvelle Cuisine movement is it's a little bit like that Who song about, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. There's a whole set of people that rebelled against the established order until they became the established order. And the minute they did, they stopped rebelling. <laughs> No one, rebe no one rebelled against them. And so it, Nouvelle Cuisine was both hugely important, but it didn't fully go forward. The other thing is that there was, an there was another name that was floated around called molecular gastronomy, which, which has a funny, funny story. Um, a French uh, magazine editor and food scientist named Hervé Thys mm -hmm. likes to say he coined that term, but in his view, that term should never be used for restaurant food or cuisine. That was a term only to be used for food science. So Hervé gets really mad if anyone used molecular gastronomy to describe a restaurant. Well, meanwhile, each of the chefs who was cooking, they hated the term. First of all, because they thought molecular gastronomy was too off-putting to some people, number one. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, number two, they said, hey, I'm doing my own thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, one friend of mine who's one of these prominent chefs would have had a journalist come to me and say, so you're a disciple of the great Hervé Thys. The guy says, um, well. <laughs> so it was this funny thing where Hervé didn't anyone, want anyone to call it. The chefs didn't want to be called that. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided, hey, I, I can call it what I want. And, and so we've called it modernist cuisine. Mm -hmm. And the idea that like modernism in art and architecture, it was explicitly about a break with the past. Mm -hmm. It was about doing things to provoke you a little bit. So a, a common trick in modernist um, uh, cuisine, particularly in the earlier years, is to have food that doesn't look like what it is, like what it tastes like, or it's a deconstructed dish. So um, uh, there's a uh, Moto a restaurant in, um, uh, Chicago, the chef's Omar Okantu, uh, they had a pizza and um, Caesar salad soup. It served this bowl of soup. It's half green, half red. And damned if the green side doesn't taste exactly like a Caesar salad. And then the other side tastes like a pizza. Now, it, it's, it's not that hard to do either one for the Caesar salad side, you basically juice a whole bunch of lettuce and put in some Caesar salad dressing, right? But the idea was to create this dissonance that you are taking a food that you don't expect. You, know, you don't expect the, the soup to taste like the, uh, a salad or, or many variations on this theme, just as uh, 
many artists wanted to provoke shock mm -hmm. or uh, to, pro to really consider art as a dialogue between the, the viewer and the artist. Mm -hmm. so. so when the book came out in 2011, a lot of people didn't know you. You really didn't have a profile in the food scene except among the chefs who you were friends with. And then all of a sudden, 2011, this book, this massive book just lands and lands in a big way. I mean, were you prepared for what happened after that? Well, we, we had this huge debate on my team as to how many mm -hmm. copies we should print in the first printing. Mm -hmm. and I wanted to print 10,000. And my team was saying, no, I don't know. We'll be giving these things away as Christmas <laughs> gifts like forever. So, you know, 5,000. And so we compromised at 6,000, which gives you an idea of how little influence I actually have <laughs> over my team. <laughs> and so we thought that was going to last the first several years. And uh, we, the, the book went on sale. The, the, meanwhile, the, the books are printed in China, and they're all put onto ships mm -hmm. going towards the US. And it takes months to print them and put them on this. Well, before they arrive, they're sold out. And then we, so we have to order more. So we order more, but it takes months. So we were completely out of stock for months and months and months, and they were going for ridiculous prices on eBay. Um, it, so we were not prepared for that, clearly. If we'd been prepared, we would have had enough copies. I love, in doing some of the homework on Nathan, I, of course, was on YouTube, and there's an entire video of a guy just unpacking his modernist cuisine book. Has anybody seen this video? It's been watched 7,900 times, which is, Nathan was amazed by. He, ha he hasn't seen it. But literally, it's five minutes, and it's mesmerizing of the guy opening the box, flipping the box, opening the next box, flipping it. So you all have to watch that when you get home. So, um, so I, another video I saw was you on the Today Show. You were the most yeah. unlikely cooking demo on the Today Show, I think, ever. And uh, Matt Lauer said to you, other than because you can, what's the purpose of this? <laughs> and I mean, it just, there's something wrong with that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> isn't it self-evident? It's yes, because I could. It, we like to say that our books are for people who are passionate and curious about cooking. Mm -hmm. If you're not passionate and curious, a 2,400-page cookbook may be a little off-putting. Um, <laughs> and you know, people say, well, can I make every recipe um, at home? And I'd say, no. But why do you need to make every recipe? Um, it, you know, part of the, the goal of the book was that anyone can make some of the recipes, but we also have recipes that would be challenging for the best restaurants in the world, the most experienced chefs to make. But guess what? You're all learning at the same time. And, and explaining how things work and uh, indulging people's curiosity, mm -hmm. which led us to this weird thing where, you know, for, as an example, we have a little biography of James Watt. Why? Because everything in your kitchen has watts on it. And I thought people deserved to know what the hell that watts meant. And in fact, amusingly, there's a, a food connection to this. Watt got a lot of the insights that helped him refine his steam engine and define units of energy and power, which of course the watt is. He got some of that insight because he was hired by a Scottish distillery who was trying to figure out why they were burning so damn much peat distilling the whiskey. And they were keeping careful records. They'd put in the peat, and the whiskey temperature would go up and go up and then go up, and then it would stall for a long time. Well, that's because it was at the boiling point. And that's because it takes a lot of energy to boil a liquid. And because it takes a lot of energy to boil the liquid, you can get that energy back out with a steam engine. So it turns out it was a food or, or beverage thing that actually inspired Watt in the first place. So now, could I have written a cookbook without that? Mm -hmm. yeah, probably. <laughs> um, but no, that isn't, that isn't how we do books. So let's jump to a different subject. Um, I want to talk about Global Good, the partnership you have <laughs> with, uh, with the Gates Foundation um, and the work that that does on behalf of children around the world. <laughs> well, technology has transformed our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, probably everybody in this room has has had their lives touched by cell phones and tablets and computers and the internet 
and Wi-Fi, and I, I go on and on and on. There's tons of these technologies, and it's transformed all of our lives. But we didn't actually need our lives transformed. It's fun. It was uh, great. I was part of it. I, I'm not saying it's bad. But we weren't at risk. Um, there are literally billions of people in the world whose lives are at risk on a daily basis, mm -hmm. who have shockingly high infant mortality. It's not just their lives are at risk. They die of a whole variety of things. And technology can't solve all of those problems. But why shouldn't we take the most potent form of magic our society has, mm -hmm. which is technology, and try to use some of that technology and some of those technology thinkers to help, help their lot? So that's what our global good um, a part of our company does, is we try to invent technology specifically aimed at the developing world. Mm -hmm. So the Modernist Kitchen Lab shares space with intellectual ventures, and you showed us one of the experiments going on when we were there with the mosquitoes. Yeah. Can you talk about the mosquito project? So um, we are against malaria, and as a result, <laughs> we're kind of against mosquitoes. So we have lots of mosquito projects, and as it happens, we've got a, a photo studio where we take the pictures for the book, and we have the kitchen where we cook all of the food, and right in between is the insectary where we grow our mosquitoes. Uh, and we have a variety of different uh, mos uh, mosquito malaria related projects. The coolest one is we have this machine that spots mosquitoes in the air and shoots them out of the sky with lasers. <laughs> no, really, we actually do that. I mean, it, it's, it's such a temptation to go like, like that afterwards, but. <laughs> um, we saw this, he, Nathan showed us this experiment, and then every time I saw a mosquito after that, I was slightly freaked out. But um, when we got the tour of the uh, facility, my favorite moment was when someone was walking us around, they said, oh, that's our old 3D printer. And I was like, old 3D printer? I was like, who has old 3D printers? But you guys have them. Um, so tell us a little bit more about the, the lab. It's such a fascinating place. It's probably the closest thing this country has right now to like Willy Wonka's factory. Well, it, it's, we have about 100 people who work there. Wow. We cover a bizarre range of technologies in one place. So uh, we invented and then have spun out a company called TerraPower that's invented a new, clean, safe form of nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. So we actually make reactor parts in the machine shop around the corner from the food lab. Um, <laughs> we don't actually have much uranium in the place, but some, <laughs> some. Um, uh, so we do these global good projects. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, a ton of other experiments in solid state physics and chemistry. Uh, and for me, it all makes sense to have it all be together. Um, you, could you could easily say, well, how on earth could you have a soft serve ice cream machine next to a 3D printer? But we do, and it w works out for us. Um, th this last year, I've been using some of our machine tools, mm -hmm. uh, our 3D printers, our five-axis milling machine, uh, to make plates. Plates? Yes, <laughs> plates. Yeah, um, so, uh, we, we, as you know, because you've been to one, we have uh, dinners every now and then where we cook for chefs. Mm -hmm. And we go into a huge amount of effort to make these dishes, but then we serve them on ordinary dishes. Right. So I thought, well, why don't, what would our style of plates be? So we've been making plates lately. So you have to tell us, what is your style of plate? They're pretty cool. <laughs> Can we buy these one day? No. Not yet. No. <laughs> Not yet. It, it's, uh, um, we, we had to find a consulting potter for some of this. Okay. Because uh, we because we want to make the plates out of porcelain. So we, what we do is we use these fancy machine tools to make the molds, mm -hmm. um, and then we uh, either by using something called hump molding. Hump molding. That's really. Okay. Now, if you search on YouTube for hump molding, you will get two <laughs> kinds of videos, <laughs> but half of them will be about ceramics. Um, <laughs> Or something called slip casting, and so we're we're actually making plates. Okay. And we never would have made plates if we just had a kitchen and we didn't have a machine shop also. Or cutting all these things in half for the books. You know, we've got 
our, our books feature these uh, cutaway photos where we've cut pots and pans and even whole stoves and ovens in half. And I, yeah, here's a picture of a barbecue that we cut in half. Um, people ask me about this picture. They say, well, did you have like glass in front to keep the coals in? I said, well, no, actually, the coals are so hot, you could not have glass. There was nothing there. She said, well, wouldn't the coals fall out? And the answer is, yes, absolutely. We had Johnny <laughs> down on his knees underneath there with tongs, and every time someone would fall, we'd kind of put it back. We discovered why people don't cook with things cut in half. It makes a <laughs> hell of a mess. We, um, we, we did a bunch of photos using a wok that was cut. It turns out there's a reason people don't <laughs> cut their woks in half. You know, we, several of us lost our eyebrows in <laughs> flames because uh, when the oil hits the flame, it's just not a good thing. <laughs> so plates is not the next big thing coming out of the lab. Uh, no, we're um, no. bread. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the main Modernist Cuisine book, we d didn't cover uh, pastry baking or dessert. Mm -hmm. um, this is our token example of, well, you have to draw the line somewhere. I mean, obviously someone who writes a 2,400 page book isn't very good at saying no. <laughs> but we decided that for our next big effort, mm -hmm. we would tackle bread. And so we have been at it for more than a year now. We've got uh, a ways to go. So sometime in 2016, you'll be seeing a modernist bread book uh, come out. It'll be, I think, a little smaller than modernist cuisine. <laughs> no, it was up to six, uh, it was up to five volumes at one point, wow. and then I beat it back to four. That shows discipline. <laughs> so are you sick of bread? No, but I've gained 10 pounds. <laughs> um, I'm afraid to even open the gluten-free door. Well, so, <laughs> excuse me. Um, we have extensive coverage of this in, in the book, both in Modernist Cuisine, we had a chapter called Food and Health that talks a lot about the health properties of, of different foods. Uh, going back to the real science as opposed to what people are told popularly, which often deviates. Uh, well, we've got a bread and health section. Mm -hmm. And the gluten issue is a very interesting one. There are a set of people who have something called celiac disease. And depending on whose numbers uh, it is, it's something like 0.75 to 1%. Mm -hmm. So 0.75 of a percent to 1% of the population has a celiac disease. And they truly shouldn't eat gluten, and they should have gluten-free stuff. Now, the gluten-free movement has expanded beyond that to a set of people who, without ever being scientifically tested for something, believe they have some gluten issue. And it, look, I never want to tell anyone what they should eat. Um, I think everyone should eat what they're comfortable with. And, but almost everyone will get a head of steam up about, hey, not only is this my choice, but it ought to be your choice. And it ought to be your choice for, re as soon as you reach for health, that's it's sort of like appealing to God or appealing <laughs> to some higher authority. You make it a moral issue. Carry it. You really ought to watch your gluten or your carbs or your whatever it is. And it's almost irresistible for activists mm -hmm. to then try to demonize things. So, you know, the, the gluten issue, there's lots of people who say, look, I vomit every time I eat it. And I say, well, fine, don't eat it. <laughs> um, I'm not saying that it's all wrong, but a huge amount of the folks who believe that they're sensitive to gluten, mm -hmm. it's highly unlikely that they actually are. Um, there is only one scientific group in the world that really found a set of people that seemed to, to have what's called non-celiac gluten intolerance, uh, a research group in Australia. And so four or five years ago, they published this paper saying, mm -hmm. hey, there really are these people, and here's the best test. Then just two year ago, they published a, oops, we were totally wrong. Mm -hmm. What those people did was interesting. They went through and they found that for the set of people who seemed to be gluten intolerant, if you fed them a diet where you secretly put gluten in, they were fine if it was pure gluten. What the, those folks seemed to be sensitive to was a different set of things, often found, but not always found, in grains. Uh, something called FODMAPs, which is a 
fermentable oligosaccharide, blah, blah, blah. it goes on forever. But it's basically stuff that makes you fart. <laughs> so the reason beans make you fart is that there are starches in beans which human di uh, digestion does not absorb. And if our digestive tract doesn't absorb it and it's there, bacteria in our guts, normal natural bacteria that are in our guts, do consume it. And when they do consume it, they make gas. They re just like we exhale, farts are the exhaling of bacteria. As gross and weird as it sounds, it's true. All right, I think I'm gonna stop you there. I, but I think that, <laughs> but that could be a great South by panel next year. I there you go. Farting, FODMAPs, and et cetera. So, um, so we have 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna take some of the questions, and okay. we're gonna make this a speed round. Okay. Okay, ready? So from Food and Wine Magazine, sous vide is making inroads in home kitchens. What modernist technique will get mass traction next? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know. That's an answer. I mean, uh, uh, combi ovens would be a good example. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are combi ovens or ovens that cook with steam mm -hmm. and, and maintain temperature accurately at low temperatures. You can use them for sous vide, but for other things. That would be my hope, but I can't really predict whether it'll happen. Mm -hmm. Combi ovens mm -hmm. are fantastic. Then um, I know we got a question. Oh, next question. Uh, Pamela Piccola Fells. Uh, you've shown lots of ways to make recipes better using new techniques. Anything you still prefer to make the old-fashioned way? There doubtless is something. I'm trying to think what it would be, though. Um, I, it, I might know the answer. Omelets? Um, well, omelets... I, I, I like old-fashioned omelets. Mm -hmm. I like to actually throw one egg white away. That's my mm -hmm. first trick. That's mm -hmm. not particularly modernist. But boy, if you can control the temperature in omelets, you can do so much better job. <laughs> so actually not. All right. Uh, this one comes from Andrew Weber. Which insight from the development of modernist cuisine is most relevant slash interesting for a home chef? Well, I think... One of the ideas that we developed quite a bit in the book is what I call two-stage cooking versus one-stage cooking. Mm -hmm. lots, of, uh, lots of cooking techniques try to balance cooking the outside of the food, searing a steak, getting a roast chicken to be brown, with cooking the inside. And the trouble is the two are fundamentally at odds. So the, this modernist approach is to say, cook the inside one way and cook the outside another way. So cook it sous vide and then, um, then sear the outside or cook it in a very slow oven and then heat the oven up then put it back and do the outside. And that two-stage thing gives you tons more control. All right, next up we have John Walsh. Where is the biggest innovation you see in food now and for the future? Two-parter. Well, you may not like my answer, but I think that the greatest current thing is interest in food is driving quality and driving a focus on food throughout the whole chain. Uh, and and it, it will take a while to reach the entire food chain and the entire food supply network, but people are interested in food. They're supporting great restaurants. They're supporting better ingredients. Uh, and. It, it takes a huge societal change to really shake up those parts. A small number of people can support a great restaurant. You know, I'm, I'm cooking at Paul Key's restaurant tonight. It's a fantastic place. I ate there last night. Um, it, but what we're seeing isn't just a few high-end restaurants. It's a movement. And I think that's going to improve every part of the food world. Yeah, that's what David... Did anybody see David Chang's talk yesterday? That's a lot of what David was talking about. Mm -hmm. All right, next we have Ford Pickup. Oh, this is a good one. What is the place of the microwave in the kitchen? So we really like microwaves. We use them for lots of things. Um, it's great for making fried herbs. It's great for making uh, beef jerky, believe it or not. You can make beef jerky, dehydrate it in um, 20 minutes, whereas it would normally take like three days. So, um, it, of course, it's great for reheating leftovers and for all of the normal things people use it for, too. But uh, there are a set of things where it really is the best way to cook. So wait, how do you fry an herb in the microwave? So you can leave with something practical. 
take um, saran wrap or some other kind of a cling filmy kind of a deal, stretch it over a plate. So it's like a drum. Mm -hmm. Take like parsley or basil or uh, sage, any sort of leaf that you, you want to do. Um, either dip it in oil and squeegee it off with your fingers or spray it with a little bit of spray oil. Put it down on the top of that drum head. Uh -huh. Put another sheet of clean film over it. Nuke it. For how long? It'll depend on the power of your microwave. Unfortunately, they're not. You know, I, I, I would do it for you 10 have, seconds you have at a time. You special microwaves that we don't have at home, I'm guessing. Well, even ones at home vary from about 1,200 watts at, for the most powerful high-end ones uh -huh. to 500 watts for the really cheap ones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's more than a factor of two difference. So you can't just give a single um, uh, number. But they come out great. Wow. Okay. Next question's from Kate. What's the best meal you've ever had? Uh-oh, that's a tough one. Well, the most e exciting meals I've ever had um, were at El Bui. This is uh, Fran Adria's restaurant. Um, everyone was completely different. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, and they were thought-provoking. Um, they weren't always individually delicious. I mean, that sounds weird, mm -hmm. but just like Stories don't always have to have a happy ending. And there are, mo there are comedies where everything is funny, but not everything has to be funny. Things can also be sad or dramatic. Um, the, the food equivalent of that is things can be bitter, or they can be, but anyway, so those are the meals that have been the most thought provoking, but best is such a funny thing, because if you're hungry enough, a very simple meal can be enormously satisfying. Um, uh, earlier today, Carrie and I consumed a nearly lethal quantity of Texas barbecue, <laughs> for example. And <laughs> we went to La Barbecue and uh, John, John Mueller's. John uh, Mueller mm -hmm. Barbecue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, let's see. If you had to pick one field now to tackle with your genius, which you have never worked in before, which is it and why? Is there anything left that you haven't done? Well. If you ask done well, it would be almost anything. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's a great question. I don't have a great answer to it. Mm -hmm. um, it we're, one of the most exciting things, though, here, I'll, I'll, I'll obliquely talk about something because it's sort of in development. Um, I, I think understanding how to get financial services mm -hmm. to the very poorest people on earth is a very interesting area. We've got some cool ideas there. It, it sounds like, in a way, almost paradoxical. How would you get financial services to people that have no money? But if you flip it around, uh, we all have banks, we have credit, we have all kinds of things that help us in our daily lives. And uh, just because people don't have very much money doesn't mean they don't need those things. Uh, there's some very exciting things going on in Africa right now. The, the country in the world with the most advanced digital currency system is, anybody know? Kenya, exactly, M-Pesa. <laughs> it's fantastic that a place that you wouldn't call a developed country, through a whole set of some luck and some good decisions and other things, has the most advanced digital currency system in the world. And I think that and a whole variety of other things like that uh, have amazing potential for technology to unlock things um, for billions of people that just live on a few dollars a day. So from Ford Pickup, we have where is food going next? You kind of touched on that. Well, here, let me give a quick. Mm -hmm. People love variety. Mm -hmm. There is more variety of food available today in Austin than at any point in its previous history. That's true of any other uh, city. Um, and for a long time, we got our variety by importing food. Like there was a day when you couldn't get sushi outside of Japan. Well, now sushi is everywhere. Well, that's great, but you know, there's very few other cuisines to go import. You know, sushi was a gem. Here these people had worked for 300 years perfecting this thing, and we had all just like, you know, oh great, now it's ours, we, we, we can eat it. Um, there are no things like that that are left. You know, just driving around here at, at South by Southwest, um, there are food trucks from Peru and every place under the sun and all kinds of weird mashups. 
you know, going forward, we can't just rely on importing new foods. We have to invent them. And we will. And that invention is how, always how we've developed new cuisines. But I think we're going to be in a golden age of the invention of exciting new ways to eat, exciting new food experiences. Um, so we have a minute left. Uh, don't forget to rate the session. Um, and I think we'll let Jonathan Gold have the last question. You all know Jonathan Gold, the uh, restaurant critic from the Los Angeles Times. He tweeted a question to us earlier that was a little obscure. His question was just, why? And I've known Jonathan since high school, as it turns out. And why not? <laughs> and you, you, you know, the, uh, there's two ways. To, I, I, I say this about our product, but it's also true of, in the, the larger sense. There's two different ways you can make a product. You can have a focus group. And you can ask them what they want. And there's sort of an us that makes the thing, and there's a them that's the consumer. And so what do they want? Um, well, there's another way which says, no, I'm going to make what I want, and then I'm going to hope other people agree. And if you want to play it safe, you should do the first one. You should ask what they want. Mm -hmm. But nothing great is ever really made that way. The, the greatest things, also the worst disasters, by the way, you make a lot of bad things this way too, but that's okay. Failure is an option. If failure isn't an option, you're not doing anything really risky. So uh, our projects are driven by our passion. I, our, I say, because it it's not just me, it's all of the talented people in our group, and our passion drives it, and that's why. Great answer. Thank you, Nathan. And thank you, everyone, for coming. We're able to believe in something that we can't prove and then try to bring that future thing into reality. It's, uh, it's magical uh, and I love it. I absolutely love the spiritual side of, of all humanity. So I think like some people who are hyper-rational, they are deluding themselves.